Welcome everyone, and thank you for attending the third webinar in the Cooperative Forestry Research Unit's new series. I'm Jenna Zuxwert, and I'm the Research and Communications Coordinator for the CFRU. For those of you not familiar with the CFRU, we are a stakeholder-driven research cooperative housed at the University of Maine. We have over 30 member organizations, which include forest landowners, wood processors, conservation organizations, and other stakeholders, who collectively represent more than 8 million acres of Maine's forests. The CFRU is a core research program in the Center for Research on Sustainable Forests at the University of Maine. This webinar is approved for one Category 1 CFE credit through the Society of American Foresters. If you would like to get credit for this webinar, please fill out the questionnaire that I will be sending you following this event as soon as, I ca as, soon as you can. We will take questions at the end of the webinar. At the bottom right of your screen, you should see an online chat box. Feel free to type your questions for the speakers at any time, but I will read through these questions at the end during our Q&A session with our speakers. If you have a question for a specific presenter, please indicate that when you type your question. Today's webinar is on the status and ecology of the threatened northern long-eared bat and the recently petitioned tricolored bat, as well as what you need to consider about their habitat and forest management and certification. I'm excited to introduce our speakers for today's webinar, Dr. Eric Blomberg, an assistant professor in the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Conservation Biology at the University of Maine, and Michael Thompson, an environmental consultant and adjunct faculty member in the School of Forest Resources at the University of Maine. Wendy Mahaney, a biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who serves as the Maine field office expert on bats, is also on the line today and will be available to answer your questions as well. We will start now with Eric's presentation on the ecology and status of this, these bats. And so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Eric. Thank you, Jenna. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us. Um, I'm happy to talk to you today about sort of a, a handful of different things centered on both the ecology of some of our bats in Maine that rely on forests, in particular the two species that Jenna mentioned, um, and also some of the current regulatory status updates primarily focused on federal regulations uh, for the two species that Jenna pointed out in particular. Um, here in Maine, we have eight species of bats that inhabit the state uh, pictured here. And we generally lump these into two distinct categories. Uh, the three bats on the right-hand side of the screen, the Eastern Red, the Silver Haired, and the Hoary Bat, are considered migratory species. They leave Maine in the wintertime and fly to more um, southerly climates. Um, they're also notable from a forest perspective because we generally think of them as roosting in uh, foliage and other elements of the tree canopy. Um, the five species shown on the left side of the screen are all generally considered uh, hibernating bats. They remain if not in Maine specifically, somewhere in the Northeast, we often associate them with hibernation in caves and mines. Um, and these are the species that from um, a, a federal regulation perspective, we're a bit more interested in, and we'll talk a little bit about the, the reasons for that in the next few slides. Um, but of these five bats pictured on the left, Two of them, the northern long-eared bat and the tricolored bat, are subjects of current federal regulations through the Endangered Species Act. Um, and I'll talk about each of those specifically. The northern long-eared bat is listed as a federally threatened species under ESA. It is also listed as state endangered under Maine's Endangered Species Act. And then the tricolored bat has been petitioned for federal listing under ESA. Um, and of the remaining species, the eastern small-footed bat is state-listed as threatened, and the little brown bat is state-listed as endangered. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service has previously considered the little brown bat for ESA listing, um, and that listing was uh, deemed unwarranted. All of these concerns over bat populations have to do with a novel disease that was introduced to North America. Um, just over a decade ago, usually referred to as white nose syndrome. It's associated with a fungal pathogen, um, superficially similar to bread mold. You can see this bat in the bottom corner of the screen with the white 
growth around its nose, also extending into its ears and wings. Um, this, is, this is the pathogen commonly known as white nose syndrome. Uh, this fungus causes disruption of the bat's hibernation cycle. Um, and because of the fact that bats uh, generally aren't designed to wake up mid hibernation, um, they basically have relatively few body reserves being aroused from hibernation causes them to burn through those reserves rather quickly um, and generally speaking leads to death of the bat during hibernation. Um, this fungus appears to be easily transmissible. It was very rapid spreading. Um, I'll show you a, a more up-to-date slide of the current distribution of the fungus on the next slide. Um, and it primarily affects cave hibernating bats during the winter time and has resulted in catastrophic population declines greater than 90% for, for some of these species. Um, this is the most up-to-date map of white nose infection uh, throughout the US through 2017 to 2018. This is, this is uh, sourced from the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, you can see the, the red circle in the Catskill Mountains of New York. Um, that was the original introduction of the pathogen. And then the color ramp here from cool to warm colors shows the spread of the disease through time. Uh, the first instances of white nose in Maine um, occurred in the you know, 2010, 2011 winter and, and onward. So the disease has now spread as far as um, Newfoundland to the Northeast and in the, over the last two winters, some isolated cases um, in Washington on the West Coast. Um, I'm gonna move into talking about those two species more specifically, the tricolored bat um, first. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over a little bit of the ecology of the species, how it relates to main forests as far as we know, um, and then talk fairly briefly about the status of this bat from a federal perspective, and then we'll move on to the northern long-eared bat. Um, you may know this bat as the Eastern Pipistrelle. Um, formerly, it was considered that species as a common name. Um, Pipistrelle are a genera of bats common to the old world, and the taxonomists decided that this, this genus in the new world was not necessarily associated with uh, the old world Pipistrelles, and so the name was changed to tricolored bat. Um, it's got a fairly expansive range in eastern North America. You can see the range map here on the left side of the screen extends as far south as Central America and the Yucatan. It is primarily associated with, uh, with broadleaf or deciduous forests, although you see we, the range extends here into, into the transition zone between the, the deciduous and conifer forests in the northeast. This is a cave hibernating bat. It's also one of the smallest bodied bats in North America. And because of that, it tends to have one of the longest hibernation periods and also prefers some of the deeper, warmer parts of the cave hibernacula that it uses. And all of these characteristics together um, make it particularly susceptible to death from white nose syndrome. So it's, uh, you know, likes warm, moist places where fungus likes to grow. It needs to hibernate for a longer period, so it's more likely to be disturbed. Um, and being a small body bat, it has relatively few body reserves to be able to withstand disruption of hibernation. So all those things come together and make this bat uh, particular, particularly vulnerable to white nose syndrome. Um, and based on uh, overwinter cave and mine counts, uh, numbers of bats, um, in known hibernacula of tricolored bats, that is, have declined between 80 and 100% uh, since the introduction of white nose syndrome. Um, this next slide is a quote from the Bat Conservation International website. I, I really put it on here to illustrate the fact that they recognize that, you know, of all of our bats in North America, um, there's relatively little known about tricolored bats. Um, but they do point out the, uh, the fact that we do know at least that they tend to be associated with uh, foliage in high trees and or uh, cavities and crevices. This is a bat that its daytime roosts outside of the winter season. 
including both roosting sites for individuals that are not reproductively active and for females that are raising pups tend to be in the foliage of trees high in the canopy. Um, there have been a small handful of research studies conducted on tricolored bats um, that have been successful in locating summertime roosts. Um, and they're summarized on this slide. And coincidentally, uh, we're going to make these slides available through the CFRU webpage at the end of the webinar. Um, so all this information will be summarized. Um, but one of the interesting things about each of these studies is they tend to find that these bats are primarily associated with either clusters of dead leaves or with things like mosses and lichen that are attached to the trees. Not so much um, roosting in live foliage, but rather either dead foliage or um, secondary uh, species growth on the trees like moss and lichen. Um, so you can imagine in, in our area here in the Northeast, uh, things like lichen could be particularly important and that was found in this study by Quinn and Broders in Nova Scotia where uh, tricolored bats were roosting um, almost exclusively in bearded lichen. So this species depends on tree foliage for roosting um, it may be unique in the fact that it tends to roost colonially in foliage, so multiple bats coming together in the same area. Um, those other, those three species of migratory bats that I mentioned earlier, they are also typically thought of as foliage roosting bats, but they tend to be associated with, um, or they tend to be uh, solitary in their roosting habits, so tricolored bats are more colonial. Um, and with all that said, there, there have been shown to sometimes roost in things like human buildings, in tree cavities, uh, but these are generally less common. They typically are more associated with leaves, moss, etc. So the, the status on this bat with respect to the Endangered Species Act is going to be relatively brief. They were petitioned for listing in 2016. Um, in a joint petition by the Center for Biological Diversity and the Defenders of Wildlife. Um, they filed this petition seeking range-wide protection of the tricolored bat as an endangered species. And in December of 2017, the Fish and Wildlife Service um, issued what they termed a substantial finding for the petition. And, and what that says is that the service determined that the petitioners had provided a sufficient amount of information to justify full consideration of the species for threatened or endangered status. And what this does is it initiates a status review by the Fish and Wildlife Service to consider the species um, and whether it warrants protection under ESA. Um, and that review is ongoing at the moment. Um, next up, We'll talk about both the uh, ecology of northern long-eared bats in forests and then give um, an overview of their status as an ESA species. Um, northern long-eared bats are located throughout the eastern United States. They're found in all Canadian provinces. Um, they, they have a, a very wide distribution in North America um, and like tricolored bats have experienced fairly dramatic population declines as a result of white nose syndrome. Um, these bats are thought to primarily use cave hibernacula during the winter time, um, but during the summer they show strong preference for roosting in cavities um, of trees or cracks and under flaky bark of trees. Um, and so unlike the tricolored bat thought of primarily as a foliage rooster, these bats are very much a bark or cavity rooster. Um, they're found throughout the state of Maine and they have extremely high vulnerability to white nose syndrome. Um, the next few slides that I'm gonna show are results of some work that we did, a group of us did through the CFRU, um, seeking to summarize the current uh, known literature and ecology of these bats. Um, and you can find this report um, on the CFRU webpage. I've got the link here on the slide. So again, with these slides being available afterwards, you can follow that link or just go to the CFRU webpage on the reports um, page that they have. And it's the 2016 report is where you'll find our, our summary. Our, 
whole goal with this was to take a look at the literature surrounding this bat in forests, pass it through some sort of a filter and think about how it would be relevant to uh, main forests in particular. Um, and we felt this was important because there has definitely been more research on northern long-eared bats outside of the Northeast than within the Northeast. And so a major focus was to ask how do the studies that have been done in areas similar to Maine compare to what we know about the species range-wide given its very wide distribution. So there have been relatively few published studies on northern long-eared bats, um, but we do have, have a, a short list here um, from areas sort of surrounding Maine to both the south, uh, north, and east. And importantly, most of these studies occurred prior to the introduction of white nose syndrome. So that's a bit of a caveat. The, the species of bat, by some measures, has declined between 90 and 95 percent post white nose syndrome. Um, and so that certainly has made a big effect on how many bats are on the landscape, which in turn can affect their habitat associations. Um, in our report, we provide a synthesis of published habitat relationships um, for various characteristics, you know, really dialing into the specific ways in which northern long-eared bats use habitat. Um, here in the Northeast, um, as well as some other characteristics like roosting behavior, whether they roost aggregate or individually, et cetera. And then we focus pretty extensively on both tree and site characteristics um, that the bats seem to be affiliated with based on the majority of these studies are ones that employed radio telemetry uh, to locate the bats in in their, uh, their roost locations. And so again, you can, you can see our report for this full synthesis. Um, you should have also seen that Jenna sent an email with a link to a, uh, a secondary document giving guidance for bat um, habitat and management of forests associated with bats. And I think the, the information we have in our report complements that fairly well in that it covers, uh, covers work here in the Northeast specifically. So we did find that there were some apparent differences between studies conducted in the Northeast and those elsewhere. And I'm going to show a series of slides here that are going to look like this. This is a summary of the uh, published characteristics for a variety of different uh, tree traits or metrics. Um, and so here we have, you know, diameter breast height, height of trees, and then the proportion of trees that were snags. Um, and just showing the distribution of values reported here in the Northeast in blue and outside of the Northeast in red. And so we do see, you know, in general, uh, bats tend to use shorter trees, um, maybe with slightly larger DBH and kind of a wider range of use of snags. But again, this is based on a relatively small number of studies. Um, so it, you know, should be viewed somewhat cautiously. Um, interestingly enough, though, studies did report, and um, for um, snags in particular, in the Northeast, anywhere from less than 50% of the trees were snags, so the bats were using as much as half of their roosts in live trees, um, up to nearly 100%. So snags are certainly important to this species, um, but not necessarily uh, the exclusive roost. Um, here in the Northeast, northern long-eared bats use fewer tree species as a whole, and they more frequently roost in conifers than elsewhere. Um, and this is probably not surprising. Many of those other studies uh, here with um, relatively low proportion of conifers um, occurred in deciduous forests where there are relatively few conifers. So the fact that our bats are making more use of conifers and fewer species probably reflects the fact that we have fewer species um, and they tend to be conifers more often here in the Northeast. Um, but what we did find is overall 83% of studies exhibited northern long-eared bats either selecting or avoiding one or more tree characteristic within the study area they worked in. So within a given region, there are certain traits of trees that the bats seem to prefer. Um, it's just not always consistent among 
um, each site and probably has to do a bit again with changing availability as you move to different areas. Um, the studies we looked at tend to be less consistent about how they measure and report characteristics at broader spatial scales. So how they report things like composition of stands or configuration of landscapes. And so it was a bit harder to get really detailed um, information here on how the Northeast varied to other regions. Um, but, you know, we do see things popping up like studies looking at, you know, what's the average stand canopy cover? Is it an upland versus a wetland forest? Um, summaries of DBH and basal area across stands. Um, and overall, you know, even though we couldn't necessarily synthesize a single metric in most cases across all studies, they did show less evidence on a study by study basis that bats were making habitat selection decisions at these larger scales. So lots of evidence that they're selecting specific trees to roost in less evidence that they are, you know, um, choosing very particular portions of forested landscapes. And part of that, I think, reflects the fact that they tend to be and tend to occur in a wide variety of forest types, which is something you might suspect given that this is a species that ranges essentially across all forested ecosystems in North America. Um, and, you know, Larger landscape scale features like elevation, slope, and riparian areas are just not things that most studies have looked at. Um, the one thing we can look at at this larger scale is stand level canopy cover was reported somewhat regularly. Um, this is showing across all studies in northern long-eared bats what's the percent canopy cover within occupied stands. Um, and then the three dashed red lines reflect the three studies in the northeast that reported this value. Um, and so in the Northeast, we tend to see the bats using greater than 50% canopy cover. Um, and that seems to be fairly true across the, the range of studies that we looked at too. So they tend to be associated with closed canopy stands and this species tends to forage underneath those canopies. Um, it's relevant to talk about Northern long-eared bats in comparison with um, another federally endangered bat that is present in the Northeast, but not in the state of Maine, and that's the Indiana bat. And the Indiana bat, Indiana bat has been listed as a federally endangered species um, for a very long time. And so there's been quite a bit of more detailed work on this species. And this photo shown on this slide is really showing a stereotypical Indiana bat roost tree. They tend to use very large DBH snags with you know, large sheets of flaky bark. Um, and part of this is because they have substantially larger maternity colonies. So colonies of Indiana bats can range anywhere from 100 to 300 females. Um, and so more bats means that they need more space. And so they tend to prefer larger diameter snags. Whereas uh, colonies of Northern long-eared bats tend to be smaller, generally in the neighborhood of eight to 10 individuals. Um, and I think that that results in them able to be more general in their selection of trees. Um, and again, some studies have reported up to 60% use of live trees uh, by northern long-eared bats for roosting. Um, and the average DBH that we see for northern long-eared bats tends to be quite a bit smaller um, than that of Indiana bats. Um, and it is worth noting that regional work here in the Northeast um, has demonstrated and found northern long-eared bats to use other landscape features for roosting, including things like rock outcroppings, um, some evidence in certain regions that they will roost in human structures, um, cabins, houses, etc. So they're primarily associated with tree roosts, but not exclusively. So last, what I'd like to go through is a, a brief overview of the current status of northern long-eared bats as uh, an ESA threatened species. All of the information that I'm gonna show here is pulled uh, directly from the US Fish and Wildlife Service webpage and information they have. And I'll have a, a series of links at the end um, to direct you to some of that uh, documentation if you're interested in. Um, but on October 
or in April rather of 2015, the service announced a final determination that the Northern Long-Eared Bat was going to be listed as a threatened species under the U.S. Endangered Species Act. Um, and that decision came out the day later and became effective in May. So as of May 4th, 2015, uh, the northern long-eared bat is a threatened species under ESA and afforded all of the legal protections that come along with that designation, most of which centers around the concept of take, which under ESA is described as harassing, harming, pursuing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, of a listed species. So basically rules governing the um, harm and disruption of listed species. And under the ESA, um, engaging in take um, is only permitted, whether we're talking accidental take or intentional take, um, when accompanied by a Section 7 permit. So basically, if your activities um, cause you to engage in take of a ESA listed species, regardless of if you meant to or not, you could be in violation of Section 7 if you don't have a permit except in the case of a uh, listing accompanied by what's referred to as a 4D rule. And Section 4D of the Endangered Species Act, Act allows the service to develop rules that permit certain activities um, that may cause incidental take of federally threatened species. This only applies to species with a threatened designation, not endangered. Um, without the need to uh, obtain take permits. And the 4D rule is generally developed in order to either promote positive conservation actions without putting undue regulatory burden on those actions, um, or to streamline the regulation process in cases where there is an expectation that there would be only minor impacts um, that aren't really expected to cause major population level harm. And um, in January of 2016, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service released uh, a final 4D rule for the northern long-eared bat uh, to allow for incidental take. Um, this 4D rule applies only to areas of northern long-eared bat range that are affected by white nose syndrome, which um, sort of increasingly is basically all of it in at least the, the lower 48. United States. Um, so this slide almost becomes a little moot when you look at the distribution of uh, the, the lighter orange, which is the area that the 4D rule applies um, relative to areas in the eastern U.S. Uh, where the bat occurs, but there is no white nose syndrome. So basically everything in orange here uh, is relevant to the 4D rule. Um, and under the final rule, um, first of all, uh, purposefully taking, so intentionally killing or harming a bat without a permit is still prohibited, um, but there are exceptions to this, and those generally have to do with human safety and health. So it's still legal to remove northern long-eared bats from human structures or um, to euthanize a bat, for example, if it's bit somebody um, and it needs to be tested for rabies, um, or if there are hazardous trees that need to be removed um, because they threaten human health. Those, those uh, methods of take are all still allowed under the 4D rule. Um, on the incidental take, so accidentally harming or um, disturbing northern long-eared bats, um, within that area is also allowed um, with a few exceptions. Um, and these are all primarily directed towards cutting down trees um, because these bats in particular uh, roost in trees, you know, uh, cutting trees that contain roosting bats uh, is, is considered take. Um, and if that incidental take is occurring, well, for one, if there's disruption that occurs within a known hibernacula, so where the bats are actually hibernating, that's not allowed. Um, including alterations made to the hibernacula, so sealing off an entrance to a hibernacula or something like that. Those would all not be covered under the 4D rule. And then with respect to tree removal, um, known occupied hibernacula of northern long-eared bats, there is a, I believe, season-wide restriction on cutting trees within a quarter mile of those areas. Um, and then number four here, uh, if there is a known occupied uh, 
maternity roost or any trees that occur within 150 feet of a known occupied maternity roost. Uh, those trees are not allowed to be cut during the reproductive season, which is defined as the 1st of June through the 31st of July. So a two month period in the summer, um, there is a restriction that incidental take cannot occur through the cutting of trees if it is known that a maternity roost exists in that location. Um, and any take that meets any of these four criteria is in violation of section nine of the Endangered Species Act. Incidental take that falls outside of these criteria is permitted under the 4D rule uh, without any extra permitting. Um, I, I zoomed in here uh, a bit to the text from the 4D rule that provides the definition of a known occupied maternity roost. Um, and the kind of key element here is in bold, if a tree has been determined to contain maternal, so females with juvenile northern long-eared bats, um, then that tree then becomes referred to as a known occupied maternity roost. Um, the, and then the last point here at the bottom um, is that with all of this said, there are no provisions under the 4D rule for um, conducting active surveys for northern long-eared bats or for locating maternal roosts. Now, with that said, Mike will talk a little bit during his portion about how this all fits into certification requirements um, and whether or not there's expectations of, of surveys being done to identify these areas. Um, Outside of the 4D rule, there is still one area where permitting um, considerations come into play, and that is in the case where there are activities that fall under what's considered the federal nexus. And so essentially, if there are forestry projects that involve federal agencies and or federal funding, such as through the NRCS or the Forest Service, um, ESA does still require a section seven consultation, which basically says that the federal agencies will consult with the Fish and Wildlife Service um, before undertaking any action that could result in incidental take, um, even if it would be governed otherwise under the 4D rule. So there is still a, a catch here if you're doing work uh, as or with a federal agency, um, you, you still need to work with the Fish and Wildlife Service um, through a section seven consultation. So to summarize here, uh, for northern long-eared bats, it is and remains a threatened species under ESA. There is some allowance for tree cutting under the 4D rule, um, as long as hibernacula and uh, maternal roost trees are adequately protected under that rule. Um, no additional take permitting is required except for that scenario um, under the federal nexus in section seven. And uh, the status of northern long-eared bats as an ESA species uh, most certainly will be reviewed and revived, revised in the future. Um, and if the species is downgraded to endangered status, then all of those stipulations under the 4D rule would no longer apply. Um, and this is because the 4D rule um, process only applies to threatened species. Um, and then, you know, the, the last point here, um, this is the subject of ongoing litigation. The 4D rule has been challenged in court and Wendy might be able to give us an update on that process um, and if there's been any, any movement there. And so the, the last slide I have here just uh, gives some web links to some of the Fish and Wildlife Services information related to northern long-eared bats um, and um, if you have any questions specifically related to Fish and Wildlife Service policy related to uh, Northern long -Eared Bats, you're certainly welcome to ask as part of the webinar here. Um, um, but uh, Wendy's contact information is at the bottom of the slide. And uh, that is the extent of my materials. Great, well, thank you, Eric. That was very interesting. Um, so at this time, I would like to give Wendy a few minutes to introduce herself and her role at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. 
Thanks, Jenna. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Wendy Mahaney, and I'm a biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in our main field office in East Orland. And thanks, Eric, for your great presentation. You, you did all the hard work for me. Um, so I'm not going to specifically give a presentation since Eric really thoroughly covered the federal listing status for a couple of our bat species, but I will be available for questions. And I just wanted to make a couple clarifying statements on three of the bat species. So I think Eric might have said that the little brown bat has been petitioned and that we made a not warranted finding. And if so, if you did say that, Eric, I think you might have confused it with the eastern small footed bat. Oh, my mistake. Yep, so I'll just clarify that. So that's one of our eight bat species in Maine. We were petitioned to list that species around the same time as we were petitioned for northern long-eared bats. And in December of 2013, we published a final rule after conducting a status review and said that species did not warrant listing as either threatened or endangered at the time. And that was largely in a nutshell based on our analysis that although the species is definitely affected by white nose syndrome, the extent of those effects weren't having population wide effects. So we didn't believe that the species was warranted. I and will uh, I will correct that on the slides that we post on the webinar. Okay, great. The and then, so what's the scoop with little brown bat at the federal level? I often get questions about that species. Um, Again, that's one of our state listed species. We have not been formally petitioned to list that species, but we do know that it has been hit pretty hard by the effects of white nose syndrome throughout its range. So we are doing what we call a discretionary status review to determine whether the species might warrant listing as threatened or endangered. We aren't due to make a final listing decision until the end of fiscal year 2023. So that's out in the future a bit. Um, if anybody has information, has collected survey information or doing research that um, obtains information regarding the species, we would love to have that information. So if anybody has that type of stuff, you can certainly contact me. And again, a final listing decision is due in 2023. And then last, I just wanted to mention that the tricolored bat, so we are doing an active status review. We have not scheduled a listing decision yet, but as part of our um, national listing work plan, we should be coming out with a schedule for that, hopefully in the very near future. I, I just talked to our listing coordinator and she's hopeful that by the end of the year, we'll have a time frame for that. But again, as Eric said, in the meantime, again, if people are doing any type of surveys or research that are collecting information on tricolored bats, we'd love, we'd love for you to share that information with us. So with that, I'll wrap it up. And again, we'll be available for questions after our next speaker. So thanks everyone. Great, thanks Wendy. Our next speaker is Michael Thompson, who will be speaking on the role of forest certification and bat conservation. So with that, I'll turn it over to Michael. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, my understanding from what we're hearing is normal forest management is um, still allowed, but um, though many of you are certified under either the Tree Farm System, Sustainable Forestry Initiative, or Forest Stewardship Council, or a combination, of those, I'll, I'm going to quickly remind you where these endangered species fit into those systems and then uh, end with just brief thoughts as an auditor, um, what I might be looking for on an audit, either probably coming up next year. Um, but then I want to leave time for questions um, for Eric and Wendy that you might have. <coughs> so let's Um, so the current certification standards, I think as most of you are aware, the, for SFI, it's the 2015-2019 standard. The Forest Stewardship Council is currently the 2010 standard, which is going through an update process, which um, I'm actually helping with. So if people have questions about that, let me know afterwards. And then the tree farm system, we're under the 2015-2020 standards of sustainability. 
general considerations across all the systems are that if you're certified, <clears throat> you pay attention to rare, threatened, and endangered species in their habitats. Forest managers understand applicable regulations um, that we just went over and what best management practices might be. And Wendy forwarded around a paper uh, today, which I recommend that you read. Uh, forest managers should understand what they can do to conserve or manage habitats at the standard landscape level for these species. Uh, in many cases, research is appropriate and that can just be supporting research as many of you did through the CFRU process and the work that Eric just mentioned, uh, but also consultation with people like Eric and Wendy regarding rare threat endangered species that might be on your property. Evidence of training where it's appropriate for forest managers might be something that would be expected. And I, I would count, of course, this webinar as training and then maybe you take this out to your field foresters in some fashion or come up with some additional training. And then in some cases, evidence of monitoring if it's appropriate. And, and that might be if you had, for example, a, a cave uh, hibernaculum on your property. So again, quickly, because you know most of these things, under the SFI standard, you've got objective four with a conservation of biological diversity. Uh, you have to have programs to address known sites with viable occurrences, and you have to have a program to protect these species. Uh, objective six, protection of special sites can sometimes be um, sites that include these rare species. Nine is legal and regulatory compliance, which we just talked about. Uh, objective 10 is forestry research, science, and technology. And I think as you're hearing, we're really at the early part of the research of these bat species. There's still a tremendous amount that we just don't know. And then 11 is training and education, which we talked about. Uh, tree farm courses, compliance with laws under standard two, standard five, fish, wildlife, biodiversity, forest health. Uh, and then indicator 5.1.1, you're gonna confer with some agencies and heritage programs about these species. So my, my sense is that uh, landowners should be starting to reach out to inland fisheries and wildlife, to people like Wendy, maybe people like Eric, to, to understand what is it that's known about these bats and their habitats that you can take out in your forest management. Uh, and that's indicator 5.1.2 for the tree farm standard. And then standard seven, of course, is protecting special sites. Under the FSC system, under principle six, which is where we look at environmental impact, there's, there's special indicators for rare, threatened, endangered species, safeguarding their habitats. Uh, and then if there's a presence of, um, a, a likely presence of one of these species, then you either verify it through a field survey or you assume that it's present. And remembering in the FSC system, we operate under what's called a precautionary principle, where is, um, if in doubt, um, be cautious and assume species are there. Uh, principle nine, high conservation value forest. Um, there may be under HCV1, a type of high conservation value forest, um, areas that are important to bats that, that come up to this level of HCV1. So really the part that I think about as an auditor, and again, I'm gonna be quick so there's time for questions, is you know, what might you expect during an audit in the coming year? And we're just learning about these bats through research and monitoring. We're having this webinar. There's the literature review that Eric mentioned. Um, but this information is just starting to filter out to, to you as land managers and to auditors. So I think we're, we're in this period of, of transition as we figure out, well, what is it we can do about bats? Uh, the takeaway that I get from a lot of what I've heard from Eric and Wendy are that um, there, there aren't many caves that are known um, as um, roosts, winter roosts in Maine, but you may have caves on your property that haven't been surveyed, so caves are something to think about. Uh, Inland Fisheries and Wildlife is doing more research on these talus slopes and rock outcrops, so maybe you have those old buildings, if you know um, an old logging camp and hey, there are thousands of bats in there, that might be something to, to take a look at. In terms of out in the forest though, they're using cavity trees, they're using lichens, but as Eric told you, there's, they're using all kinds of other trees. So right now I think it's hard for us to say, protect these particular trees. And because populations are so low, they're not limited right now by available cavity trees and roost trees. So my sense is that the, the work you all mostly do now related to cavity trees is probably what's relevant. But what might we expect? Um, are the forest managers aware of what species are listed? And we just went over that. Uh, that might occur on your particular ownership. 
has there been consultation with agencies and other experts regarding important habitats? Uh, for example, reaching out to say, are there are, are any of these known caves or mines on my property? Chances are you probably already know if they are, um, but there may also be known old mines that just haven't been surveyed yet. So some kind of consultation and outreach would be appropriate. Uh, do you have a written plan for addressing these rare bats on your ownership? And that might be just a modification of the existing set of guidelines that you have that suggest um, being careful. You know, if you have, to me, if you have a cavity tree, a larger tree, a defined cavity, maybe there's flaky bark and lichens, that has a really good chance of being a roost tree and, and maybe uh, absent a survey treated accordingly, as opposed to just a normal dead snag without flaky bark, for example. Uh, have field foresters received any kind of training in bat ecology? Um, and they know what features to look for at the stand level that might be important, uh, such as potential maternity roost trees. Even though we don't really know of roost trees or there's, um, there hasn't been um, a statewide inventory, it's possible that you're out doing an inventory prior to harvest and you look up in a cavity and wow, there's a lot of bats there. Um, that's not likely to happen, but it could happen. So foresters should know you know, what is it I'm looking for? And if I look in a tree or, or even an old logging camp and I see lots of bats, what should I do? Um, do you understand the time of year when maternity roost trees are important? We just heard the June, July restrictions. And the, for, the landowners and forest managers support research in the bat use of managed forests. And as most of you are CFRU members, the answer to that is yes. So uh, I think, as I said earlier, I think it's a time of of learning as to how this is going to apply on certified forests. Um, but these are the things that occur to me given the state of the science right now. And again, I want to end it right there and leave time for questions. Great. Well, thank you, Michael. Thanks for that presentation. Um, again, if you want to ask any questions, um, you should be able to see the, groom, the Zoom group chat window. Um, and you can type your questions there. So we do have one question so far, and this is a question from Nathan K. and Walker Day from Seven Islands, and they're asking um, for Eric regarding the known occupied maternity roost sites. Um, oh, where, where the chat? Okay. They are asking, um, are the June 1st to July 30th dates arbitrarily applied throughout the entire range, or do northern, northern long-eared bat puffing season vary by region? Um, yeah, uh, I, uh, my understanding is that the the dates are constant across the range. I don't think there's any regional variation and Wendy can correct me on that if I'm wrong. Um, I did happen to, as, I, as Mike was presenting, look back through the information we summarized in the CFRU report and we saw the sort of the the commonly thing reported for bats is a paturition date, which would be the point at which the youngs begin to leave the colony and, and venture forth on their own. And in the three studies in the Northeast that reported it, that is as early as the 2nd of July and as late as the 20th of July. So it kind of spans and approximates uh, pretty well, at least here in the Northeast, uh, the ending date of that period. And that's that's the mean date, which in, would, to my mind, indicate that you know some bats are staying longer than that before they're mobile and able to to leave the maternal colony. Great. Um, let's see if we have any other questions. Um, Wendy, a quick question for you. Um, can you confirm that normal forest management activities are not restricted currently? Yes. So as Eric explained under the 4D rule, the only restrictions on normal forest activities are those specific things that would either occur within a quarter mile of a known hibernacula or would affect the environment in the hibernacula or alternatively within 150 feet of a known occupied maternity roost tree. Other than that, forest management activities are not restricted at all. Okay. 
So we've got two more questions that have just come in. Um, a question from Dan Nisha. Uh, what is happening in the development of treatments against white nose syndrome? Um, are there any success stories with any treatments of any kind? And do you see any populations increasing? Um, I, I can I can speak briefly to that. Um, and if Mike or Wendy knows anything above and beyond what I say, chime in. Um, the I, I think it's safe to say that there have been a few, you know, kind of proof of concepts. Like we can, you know, take an infected bat and potentially either rehabilitate it or or treat it. But I don't think that there's anything that is you know, something that clearly looks as though it could be scaled up. Um, and as, as fungus tends to be, um, you know, the, the fungus associated with white nose syndrome is incredibly resilient in persisting in these, these cave environments in particular. So um, it's, it's certainly, unfortunately, no real uh, smoking gun yet. Um, Okay, and following up on that, it's a question from Dan Hudnett. Um, are there any white nose syndrome resistant individuals surviving an infective hibernacula? I, th I think from what I've seen and heard, in certain systems, they are finding particular individuals that are able to persist um, either with infection and survive the experience or without being infected. Um, and a lot of it seems to have to do so far with, you know, the larger sized bats are more resistant. The bats that are inhabiting certain parts of cave ecosystems that have a less favorable microclimate for the fungus um, tend to be less affected. And so, so the answer is yes. And I, I couldn't really though tell you the extent to which, you know, at the population level that's happening. Great. We've got another question from Nathan and Walker asking, are portable ultrasonic devices such as the wildlife acoustics echo meter useful or accurate for forest managers to detect bat presence on the landscape? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, from, from my perspective, we did a fair amount of work with those as a potential citizen science tool. And I, I would say if, if you're really interested in doing um, monitoring within your forest, you're probably still better off with the stationary acoustic detectors, um, only because especially for species like northern long-eared bats, the, the, the numbers of them on the landscape are so low right now that at a given site, it might take, say, you know, a week of monitoring to actually detect the, you know, the low numbers of individuals that are there. So the, the time commitment for a handheld device for some of these rare bats is, is probably not terribly practical. So I would, I would still err on the side of using stationary acoustic detectors, whether they come from Wildlife Acoustics or Patterson or any of those companies. Right. Um, another question, this is from Jason asking, inside the quarter mile buffer on hibernacula, is any form of forest management allowed? And if so, what are the best management practices for timber harvesting? Wendy, can you answer that? Sure. So again, if somebody wants to do some tree removal activities within a quarter mile of a known occupied hibernacula, then we need to talk. Um, and it's really difficult. There, so there aren't any guide, guidelines beyond that. That's at a point where you could be causing prohibited take and we would need to talk. Um, and it could be a matter of talking about timing. For instance, if timber management activity is something that could be done in the winter when the bats aren't gonna be roosting in trees, we could certainly make a determination that that particular forest management activity would not result in prohibited take. Um, so again, there's there's nothing that goes beyond that. If you're gonna, if you think you want to cut trees within a quarter mile of a known hibernacula, that's when you need to come talk to the Fish and Wildlife Service. 
and we can better understand what you're proposing to do, figure out if there are ways to avoid taking bats. And if, if you simply can't, you can, in some instances, get a permit to take the bats. Okay, next question is from Gordon asking, given Northern Longyeard bats preference for stands with 50% canopy closure, what is the likelihood that a retention patch of about one to two acres within a clear cut or overstory removal would be used for roosting? Um, that is a, a tough question. I, I don't know that I could point to any particular work that's been done. Um, I was just taking a look at um, one paper that actually looked at bat use of of, uh, of forest stands that had undergone harvest. And they did actually find, this actually, I'm, I'm looking ahead a bit to Henning's question too. Um, this is a paper by Owen et al. in 2003. It's referenced in our report. Um, they, they found greater use of stands that had undergone some diameter limit cutting compared with, um, they, and I got to restate what I said, they didn't find greater use of di diameter limit cut stands, but they found that bats preferred them more than what was available to them compared to intact unharvested stands, which were actually slightly avoided relative to what was available. Um, so some evidence there that certain forest practices can promote um, greater use, at least, by northern long-eared bats. Um, to come back to the relatively small retention patch question, I, I would, you know, my, my gut reaction there, Gordon, is to say that it would depend a lot on what the surrounding forest looks like relative to the retention patch. I think a small patch in the middle of a large clear cut um, might have relatively little likelihood of use only because they, you know, they're ultimately, a, a you know, below forest canopy foraging species. Um, a, uh, you know, a, a stand with some residual overstory with a retention patch in the middle, you know, they might, they might make heavier use of the surrounding area. So, um, but that's, you know, that's just sort of me thinking through the the biology of the species, not necessarily leaning on any particular data. Right. And then the last question, which Eric, you've touched on a bit is, um, can you speak to the general benefits of forest management to forest bats, um, diversity of habitats, insect diversity, foraging habitats, et cetera? Um, yeah. And I think, you know, the, the distinction there too, is whether we're talking about northern long-eared bats specifically or bats as, as a whole, because, you know, each species has its own niche that it's interested in and that it, it tends to occupy and forage within. And so I, I, would, I would go out on a limb and say that in general, as you increase heterogeneity within a forested landscape, you increase the, you know, availability of habitat for the whole suite of species. Um, and then for northerns in particular, you know, they are, they do depend on uh, insects uh, for forage. And so forest practices that promote healthy invertebrate populations while also providing adequate roosting availability, I would think would, would have a net positive benefit for sure. Great, well, it's just about two o'clock. So if, um, if anyone has any last questions, can type them now, but otherwise I think we'll wrap things up. Um, so thank you to our presenters for speaking today and thank you to all of, all of you for attending our webinar. Um, as Eric mentioned, the slides will be posted on the um, CFRU public facing website in the next week or so, uh, along with a recording of this webinar. Um, and if you would like to get SAF credit for this webinar, uh, please check your email in the next day or two for the form that you will need to fill out in order to get this credit. Um, we have one very last question. Um, will bats using a known cave hibernaculum also occupy any adjacent caves as well? And is there a limiting distance? 
but then after that we'll end the meeting. This is Wendy. So yes, bats are known to move between adjacent hibernacula. I don't know off the top of my head um, specific distances. I don't believe we have that situation in Maine, or at least that we're aware of that. So again, they, they will move between high vernacular, but I'm not quite sure of distance. Eric, maybe do you have any information on that? Um, I probably would have given a very similar answer to that. I think in Maine in particular, you know, there only are a small handful of known high vernacular, and so um, movements between them are probably unlikely given the distance. Um, but uh, Certainly, if you had situations where there were multiple potential hibernacula within short distance of each other, um, movement within a winter would be possible. And then I think we definitely know that individual bats will use different hibernacula across different years as well. So there is a little bit of mixing that occurs that way. Great. All right, so I think we'll officially end things now. Um, thanks again to everybody and look for the recording and the slides on the CFRU website in the next week or two.